Well, good morning and welcome to the Rock United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you're here with us this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the guys who worked hard on, on straightening up our, our uh, external areas, our, the mowing and the weeding and those, those things that needed to be done. What a blessing it is to have people that will volunteer to do that work. Um, you're, you're really wonderful guys and appreciate it. Would you bow your heads with me for the opening prayer? Blessed Lord, we present ourselves in humble adoration of your gloriousness. We recall your faithfulness to all of your children. We gratefully accept your hand as you walk with us every single day. Your generosity and your goodness never fail. We always live an abundant life full of joy. Even though we have our difficulties, Lord, we know that you're there and you're there with us at every minute of every day. Lord, let the Holy Spirit be with us and within us today. We join all of those who worship and confess you as we practice this faith in you and in Jesus Christ. Amen. Please call, or please stand for the call to worship. This morning we'll do the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born by the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into the heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, our Father Almighty. From, From thence he shall come, come to judge, judge the quick and the dead. Uh, I, believe I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic, Holy Catholic Church, Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection, resurrection of the body, and life, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Uh, I want to remind you guys, we have a, uh, the wagon up here for the children's uh, uh, playground, and, and it's maybe in the next month or so, it's going to be a reality. We're getting pretty close to, to getting what we need. And uh, i like for you, everybody, pass the peace, and God bless everybody. Good morning to all. Today's men's Almighty God, we come before you in Christian obedience and awaiting your word. Lord, let us all be followers of your will and leaders in our homes, workplaces, church, and community. We pray for your grace upon us. Lord, heal those among us who are sick or troubled. Bring comfort to this land. Heal us in our sins and illnesses. Let us be known for our Christian love for one another. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Please stand and sing, Lead On, O King Eternal. First Bible reading this morning comes from Joshua 15 to 22. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us out of our parents, up out of Egypt, from that land of slavery, and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is holy, he is God, he is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. This is the word of the Lord. Peter 3, 14. Forget that. thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any but the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, 
and at peace with him. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand and sing How Great Thou Art. from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 12 through 23. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. May God himself the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body 
be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel reading. Today's gospel reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, and, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As just as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's places, palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. This is the word of the Lord. Be you may be seated. <clears throat> I could stand here and try to tell you I found my way here on my own Brought to light this heart of stone Made up my own mind To change my own life Working my own way to good As if anybody could But the truth is I've been broken Since my very first breath the truth is I've been wandering since my very first step. I know the only reason I can stand here unashamed. It's not because I'm worthy. It's all because of mercy. There's no way that I could earn it. Praise God my debt is paid. It's not because I'm worthy. It's all because of mercy. It's all because of mercy I still remember The day he found me Six feet under all my shame I heard him call me out by name Hallelujah The cross is spoken Jesus my Savior bled and died Bring this dead man back It's 
not because I'm worthy. It's all because of mercy. There's no way I could earn it. Praise God, my debt is paid. It's not because I'm worthy. It's all because of mercy. 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 Thank you, Damien. Kids Rock, please join Miss Danae in the back. Uh-oh, Ellen put up the military picture. What does that mean? That means veterans, we're going to hear a little something briefly about, about the military. Sorry about that. I've tried. This is, I, I was able, this is kind of like somebody with, with uh, an addiction. Um, <clears throat> I went three weeks without mentioning the military once, in case you didn't notice it. And now, now I just, just have to do it a little bit. So the name of this thing is, the name of this sermon is The Edge. And before I go on, I want to like, I'd like to welcome those who are joining us via www, the World Wide Web, therockumc.com, and those who will see us on Facebook. So, parachuting, this is, this is uh, tactical parachuting, but I really want to start off talking a little bit about skydiving. If anybody's ever done it, <clears throat> imagine standing on the back of that platform at 40,000 feet. This is the height at which people do high altitude, high open parachute jumps. You pre-breathe oxygen before you go. You get ready. You hook up to what's called a bailout bottle. You've got a mask. You look like an F-15 pilot. And you prepare. And as you step to that back door, all of a sudden, the crystals begin to start from the outside of your mask and start moving in. And they do that because it's minus 70 degrees or so up there. It's really beautiful, though, at at daybreak or nightfall. You have about an inch that you stand back before you're getting ready to leave, to leave the uh, aircraft. The cold, the roaring of the engines, the sun coming up from the east, perhaps still not reaching the west. Man, there's some sensory overload here. Your heart begins to beat a little faster. You, you breathe a little bit harder and a little bit deeper. As the countdown begins to go, and then you're told to go, and as you leave the aircraft, you can see the edge of the earth curving away at seven to eight miles above the earth. You can see the edge of darkness. The view is absolutely surreal. It's one of the most beautiful things you can imagine. When you launch yourself into this darkness, you're literally flying while you fly, while you fall. The wind rushes by your head. Your helmet visor will finally clear. You know, some parachutists who have jumped from as high as 40,000 feet have opened up just below that and have been able to fly for 65 miles, 65 miles in the, in the air before they land. Then I want you to think about another kind of, a kind of being on the edge, free diving. Free diving is a very unique experience. These people often go into a blue hole in the, in the Caribbean, just off the, the coast of the Bahamas. There, they also pre-breathe. Well, as they pre-breathe, they can feel their body being charged with, with oxygen, but also anticipation, and they have to learn to slow their heart rates. Each breath that they take helps them, helps them relax and, and prepare for what they're about to do. They're about to enter the depths where they have no source of air at all. No oxygen to breathe, nothing to save their lives if something goes wrong. It's them against nature. They have to hold their breath for sometimes up to 10 minutes. Now, this is scuba diving. This is not free diving, but they have to hold their breath for up to 10 minutes, if you can imagine. 10 minutes. That's a long time. If you've ever tried to hold your breath for that period of time, it's very, very difficult. Folks, a breath of water is like no breath at all. When you choke that in, if that's what happens to you, you know that you're in trouble. 
But free divers, they've done this lots of times. They've started out at different depths, and they've, they progress through their, through their, through each episode. They learn how to do these dives even better. In the first few feet, you have to clear your ears because the, the pressure changes. As you slip below the water, you can actually hear the pulse in your head. At deeper than 100 feet, you might have symptoms of something called nitrogen narcosis. I know you're all good Methodists, and none of you have ever had a drink in your life, but if you did, this is what nitrogen narcosis is like. You can feel the, your wetsuit beginning to press against and around your body as your depth increases. You feel this little bit of tipsiness going on. What that is is a sled, and the sled are attached to a rope, and that rope helps guide these people down. The world record, if you can believe this, is 214 meters below the surface. 702 feet down and back up again. Your body and organs are compressed as you go down there. You're tolerating 300, here on surface, you're tolerating 14.7 pounds against your skin. At that depth, 316 PSI is pressing you from every direction. So no limit free driving is not, free diving is not something that everyone does. It's not the simplest thing at all. Many have dropped, dropped into the edge and never returned. How about mountain climbing? Mountain climbing and free climbing, those are, those are kinds of things that put us on the edge. Some of us older folks know that if you, if you climb a ladder sometimes, just even, even a short 12-foot ladder, by the time you get to the top, your legs are quivering. Imagine trying to climb up a 1,000 or 2,500 square foot cliff or a mountain. Now, free climbers are a little bit different. Free climbers actually use, they usually stay right around 1,000 feet in their climbs, but they use friction, and they use different hand holds, finger holds, and toe holds to get into things. They often climb things called mantles or chimneys or cracks where they can feed their arm up, and by making a fist, they can hold themselves inside a crack and pull themselves up and then do the same thing with the other hand and then be looking for another place to grab their fingers. It's a tough tough sport. They look for the handholds, the footholds, the, these toeholds, and everything they can do so that they don't go over the edge. Imagine climbing, doing that, climbing a cliff like that with nothing but this, your normal strength. It's tough and something that you have to train with. Now, technical climbers use all kinds of things, but they also go in all kinds of different places. Technical climbers use ropes and harnesses and carabiners and pitons and ascenders and, and what's things called chocks and blocks and screws. They have all this equipment. And you'll notice they'll have a belt and they'll have it dangling from that. And they have these, these wondrous ropes that, uh, that have been developed over the years that, that don't scruff, and don't, don't tear, and don't, they certainly don't break. And so these guys will often have a safety person go up ahead or maybe even they have placed chocks ahead of time they get a lead climber who can get up and get, put the chocks in so they can put a safety line through. But still, climbing up, again, this sort, of a, this sort of a precipice is a very difficult thing. People will climb in the absolute worst weather, worst conditions that you've ever imagined. They climb to the top of mountains, frozen waterfalls, up cliffs, anywhere you can imagine to feel what it's like to be at the edge. Now, I'll tell you, the challenge is exhilarating. There's a place in Europe where service members from Austria, Austria Switzerland, Germany, Britain, um, Fr and France all go for a two-year course in mountain climbing. And if you graduate that, you're, you're called a Bergfier. And it's a huge honor to, to have done that. For two years, you climb mountains every single day, and that's all you do. There's one other crazy thing that people do. Uh, there's lots of other crazy things that people do. But in, there's one that I'm going to talk about, and that is wingsuit flying. Wingsuit flyers are just a little bit crazy. You've got to be a little different to do this. This is death-defying craziness, more than, more than almost anything, because these folks dive off of mountains and buildings, and towers, and anything else that they think that they can get off and get enough lift to save their lives. 
They need to gain enough speed where their suit acts like a wing, like a bird's wing, and gives them lift. Because in their world, lift is life. They wear these suits that act like bird's wings. They fly a chosen path, which I've always thought is the most interesting thing through this, through valleys or between buildings. And, and then when it's finally time, it may be as low as 500 feet, they'll pull a ripcord on a parachute, which takes two to 300 feet to deploy, and the parachute will hopefully open and they will be able to land safely. Let's be honest. Everyone, all of these folks are all risk takers. They live at the edge of what they're doing. Some people derive pleasure from risk taking and living on the edge. Most of us do actually. Most of us like a little bit of a challenge in our life. Maybe all of us do. When we do these kinds of things, our bodies release something called endorphins and adrenaline, and those give us the fight or flight idea. They tell us what to do. They tell us how to respond to what's going on. And there's a huge rush when those endorphins hit. It's incredible. It makes us feel good, and people like that. And I see people shaking their head going, no, no, not, maybe not that way. But there's other ways. There's, there's pleasure in taking certain risks. It's why some of us drive too fast. Don't raise your hand, but who's had a speeding ticket in the last two years, Ellen? No. <laughs> We take risks in business, don't we? We take risks when we, when we, when we get a loan that we're, that we're not sure that we can actually pay back. We like competing in games, don't we? We like it when, it, when and we love to watch games where the score is close. By the way, does anybody know what happened with Dallas and the Raiders yesterday? No? No, none of us know. Okay, well, don't, if you do know, don't tell anybody because it's going to be on TV. It should be taped uh, this afternoon. You see these behaviors of taking risks first, first and foremost in warriors. I will tell you, combat is a horrible thing, but there's a certain addictive excitement to combat. Some people love it. Why? Well, someone once told me that combat is the ultimate game of tag. Yeah, it is. It's definitely the ultimate. Robert E. Lee actually said, it's well that war is so terrible, lest we would grow so fond of it. The major generals, the, the thinking and the, the various techniques that they used and the tactics and the, and the strategery, thank you, thank you, President Bush, the strategery that they used were, uh, were things that they had planned and learned and taught and taught others, and the way that they moved armies around was a remarkable thing. And once you got to the top, Many times it was, it was very exciting. You know, some people are willing to do physical, uh, to have physical injuries, to risk their finances, to uh, even risk death to have a little bit of excitement because they want to be on the edge. They don't want to be in ordinary times. They don't want to be in regular times. If you've ever ridden on a zip line or a roller coaster, you know a little bit of the feeling that I'm talking about. Doing these kinds of things brings you to the edge. It may be the edge of your existence, it might be the edge of your courage, the edge of your tolerance, the edge of your physical ability. It can be the edge of a lot of things. What makes people do this? Some folks love to push the limits. They live for the time in between the ordinary time, you know, the exciting times, and those are good times for many of us. They seek the extraordinary in their lives. We call those folks adventurers trailblazers, daredevils. Now, there's another group of people that we all know, some of us are related to, people who have experience in law enforcement, people who are firemen, people who are paramedics. Now, those people live on the edge all the time. You know, their lives are, are there and they're, they're, some will tell you their lives of boredom that are punctuated by absolute controlled chaos. When something goes bad, it goes very bad. I don't know if all of you heard, but we had some crazy people shoot at the JBSA gate the, uh, there at Lackland twice this weekend. Drove by and shot at, shot at the people there. Please have a tough time. So do the paramedics and the firemen and all those first responders. 
people that drive those vehicles just so fast and with all that noise and always are, are responding to an area where other people are panicking. Their jobs have a similar feel to the excitement that we've talked about early in, earlier in this death-defying activities that people do because they, in fact, do defy death all the time. These folks live between these in-between times where we're almost at the edge. They live between times of peacefulness and terror, of clarity and chaos. Most of us folks who do work in these kind of jobs wouldn't do anything else. They love it. These guys love this. These women love this. I can relate to living in the in-between times. And there were times between the time we would deploy and the times that we would come home. And there were times in my personal life between taking medical boards and actually getting my license. That was a stressful period of time. There's many, many things that, that we, where we find ourselves in the in-between times. In the church, we call them ordinary times. How about the time after learning, perhaps, that you were pregnant and that you were going to have the baby and the baby had not been born yet? That's an in-between time. It's exciting and a bit scary for new parents. How about acceptance to university and, and then actually graduating? You have lots of in-between time, but you have, you have that time where you're on the edge of getting ready to graduate from high school, and then you're getting ready to go to college, and you wait and wait to hear if you've been accepted, and then you're accepted, and then you're back in the grind again. And then right before you graduate, you're once again on the edge. How about the time between being diagnosed with an illness and being better? Those are all in-between times. Joyful, uncertain, anxiety-inducing, wondrous anticipation. Sometimes times to rest and recover. Other times it's time to prepare to do something else. Some folks have an unquenchable desire to do something to help, serve, or solve things. They experience fulfillment in that way. We can learn a lot about ourselves when we find ourselves in these in-between times. We have to persevere in those times. We have to get through them. Sometimes the in-between, the ordinary times, are just as tough as those times when we're standing on the edge. Persevering, persevering, persevering. It's actually persevering, but persevering is an activity between the beginning and the end of a challenging time. We have to determine, are we courageous? Are we generous? Are we caring? Are we empathetic? Will we do the work that it takes to get us through? Are we committed? Are we grateful? Right now, many Protestant churches are in ordinary time. Ordinary time is time between Easter and Advent. This is a time when the church begins to realign itself somewhat. We begin to, we begin to take a break, and we begin to figure out what we're going to do in the next year. Ordinary time lasts through the summer and into the fall. And it's a time where many of us take vacations. We take a little time off. We relax. It's really a blessing to see so many of you here today because we've had so many people on vacation, so many folks traveling, so many folks being with their loved ones who live in other places and, and appreciating the wonder of God's beauty. Ordinary time gives us an opportunity to clear our minds, to build strong relationships, and to prepare for this busy and devoted season we're about to get into. This new season is a season of invitation and a season of worship. It's a time as we prepare through these, through these holidays to get a better relationship with God, to become closer to Him, and to become closer to one another, to share both the responsibilities of the church and to share the wondrousness of the church. Ordinary time can be a little too ordinary sometimes. We get used to get being kind of stagnant in our spiritual lives. Complacency li limits our, our spiritual experiences, doesn't it? When, when we get tired or when things are always the same, we become a little bit complacent. If Christianity falters in our lives, though, we hold responsibility for that. We need to have Christianity where, which we can all share. I was talking to our new friends here today, and we were talking a little bit about how we feel in the various churches that we've been through, in the way that we share God, in the way that we share the Holy Spirit, and that's important. 
They're talking about how they've done Bible study and how we do Bible study, which are remarkably similar, and how we are able to share through the Holy Spirit different ways that different things are revealed to us. Every Christian has a responsibility to do that. The most difficult thing about that last sentence is that you have to accept it. As believers, we stand on the edge between the physical world and spiritual heaven. When a skydiver jumps or chooses to, he or she gives up the safety of the earth and and takes up the danger of the sky and steps into the edge. When a free diver goes under, they give up the safety of the boat and the safety of being able to take a breath for the time that they'll be under. When we give our lives to Christ, we give up the safety of not caring, of not being responsible for the world around us. Well, let me tell you, it's dangerous to care because you can get hurt. When you care about something or somebody or lots of somebodies, you can be hurt. It's dangerous to give something of yourself to, to someone else. It really is. It comes with a price. It comes with a price of becoming responsible for the relationship that we have with them and God. You know, we're all going to be held accountable for our actions. We'll be expected to have participated in Christian life. You know, we all have to be vulnerable too, don't we? Because people want to see the real us, who we really are. Someone once said, a ship is safe when anchored in the harbor, but that's not what ships are for. Another said, to those who fought for it, freedom has a flavor that the protected will never know. If your goal is to merely live and never be challenged, never be hurt, never have pain, never care about anyone else, you probably do not know Jesus like you thought you did. Amen? Our Lord did not take the safe road. He didn't take the safe way. He never took a shortcut in order for his life to be better. So if that's what you're looking for, you're probably in the wrong place. We are ultimately responsible for the choices we make when we decide to step off that edge into God's family. How will we serve God? We need to challenge ourselves spiritually. We need to meet the challenges of others because there's so many out there who have so far more challenges than we do. There are the hungry and the poor, people with no homes, people with no clean water, people with just nothing to themselves. People who don't have clothes, people who don't have warm coats during the winter. And that's just to name a few of the things that others need. You know, Jesus lived on the edge. He didn't soft sell salvation and he didn't soft sell Christianity. He never told us it was going to be easy. You know, some folks wait for God to do everything. Some have an expectation that he's going to provide here on earth with no effort on our part. I know a young lady who frequently tells me things that make her sound religious. She says that God gives her everything she needs. It reminds me of a story. A fellow was stuck on a rooftop in a flood. He prayed to God for help. A man in a boat came by and shouted, hey, come on down, get in my boat. And he said, no, don't need it. God's going to save me. Soon a helicopter came by as the waters came up and began to cover the the roof. And the crew chief called out to him, grab the rope and we'll drag you to safety. The man said, no thanks, God's going to save me. So the helicopter flew away to save others. Soon the water rose over and the man drowned. He went to heaven and he finally got his chance to talk to God. And he said, Lord, I had faith in you. You let me drown. Why didn't you save me? God looked at him and replied and said, I sent you a boat and a helicopter. What did you want? I love this story. It's funny, but it also reflects a real expectation of God. We got to do some stuff for ourselves, and we got to help others. Living in this in-between time or the ordinary time is not the life of a Christian. When we don't have a mission or a purpose, when we simply coast in life depending on others to fulfill us, our work is not done. Living in this in-between time can be uncomfortable, but we're not alone in it, and we should never feel alone in it. The Apostle Paul told us in Romans 8, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth up to the present time. 
Not only so, but we ourselves have been who have seen the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. In much shorter words, that means from the very beginning, from the dawn of creation to the very present, we have waited to receive our inheritance as children of God. And we have been given the first fruits. The first fruits are the best of all. Paul is clear that even though we've received the Spirit, we've not completely arrived spiritually, have we? All of us know hardship, or we've known it before, or we will know it. Yet in Jesus, we've been given the best of what the Spirit has to offer. Sometimes it takes a while to get out of the ordinary and, and in between times and move towards the edge. Second Peter says, don't forget one thing, dear friends, that the Lord, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. The Apostle Peter encouraged patient as the Lord is working in his time. His time and our time are not the same. On earth, on this terrestrial body, this is our time. This is when we're going to make a difference in some, some child's life, in someone who's never, never learned about Christ, some person who is ill, some person who, who needs our help, who needs our hand held, who needs an arm around them, who needs to hear the words, God loves you and I love you. Knowing what God has prepared for us puts us on the edge of his celestial kingdom. Our God is a patient God, though. He offers his time so that we can get through all the things that we need to get through. We need to be able to repent, turn towards him, obediently live his commands. And God's willing to wait patiently while we do that. We can be passionate in prayer. We can be diligent in worship, and we can be committed to his service. You know, it's far easier to joyfully surrender our lives to God's timing than to try and make our own timing and force it upon him, because that is never going to work. We can rejoice in God's promises. We can move ahead with the vision that he's given us. Do you know you are all part of his plan? Each one of you is part of his kingdom. We don't know what's on God's day planner today, do we? Jesus said that the kingdom of God is near. You're standing on the edge. Your actions can change the world. Most of us live in anticipating the return of Christ so that the fullness of God's kingdom will be realized. We're waiting. There, Philippians 2.9 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and even under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Waiting for his return places us right on the edge. Now here's a weird thing that you're probably never going to hear in another sermon. I'm reminded of an old Aerosmith song. It has very strong Christian overtones, though. There's something wrong with the world today. I don't know what it is. Something's wrong with our eyes. We're seeing things in a different way, and God knows it ain't his. God made each of us a free moral agent. We choose our own paths, our own edge to stand on. And I think that that means that we don't need to fear failure. We should care more than others think is wise to do. We should risk more than others believe is safe. We should dream more than other people think is practical. And we should expect more than what other people believe is possible. You can tell who lives on the edge. It's a person who lives fully in the arena of life. They're stained with dust, sweat, blood, and tears. When they fail, they fail having had the courage to try. When they win, they feel God's blessings and that inhabits their soul. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we give you thanks for the blessings of this holy time in your house. You illuminate life, hope, and all things that are good. Help us turn towards that light in our lives. We rejoice at the gift of your Son who taught us to love in your name. Lord, help us to have the peace and see the justice all the days of our lives. Let your kingdom come and your will be done now and forever. Amen.
welcome. We want to thank all of our visitors that are here today. Welcome, welcome. We're glad you're here. We hope you will join us again next week. If you take a look at your bulletin, we have a lot going on coming up. So we need your help. There's a big, huge rummage sale coming up. We need your help. There's another movie night. There's national night out. There's exercise. There's Bible studies going on. There's bingo. I mean, you name it, it's happening right here, but we need your help. We need everybody's help to, to get all this done. Fall Festival, huge project that we're doing. So please see Harry or see any of the project managers that are listed and tell them, I'm ready, I'm here to help, what can I do, okay? It's been a great day. Please stand and let's sing, Open the Eyes. It's the wrong song. <laughs>
A special presentation right now um, from our lay leader, Harry. Brooklyn. Harry is speechless? What? I got your, I got yours in the back. I, I, your sister too. I, want to, I just want to say something before we get started. <clears throat> we have some awesome kids in this, in this church. You know, they, you, you've seen her come from up top. You know, uh, we have fundraisers. You know, we, anything that we have here, they're always here to support us. It's, uh, you know, this young lady and her sister, and it's many more. I'm going to talk about two special ones today. But I had a, a certificate of appreciation to you, young lady. This award is given to you. Thank you for your hard work, commitment, and dedication to our mission. We appreciate and are grateful for your work. Yours is Put mom and dad on, on <clears throat> up front when something good happens. So I'm gonna call you two come up front. Don't don't push each other. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna just want to say that uh, uh, we love this these two, and and their their son Ethan. Uh, 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 he's not here right now. Uh, they're kicking him out. He's 18, 19 years old, and he's <laughs> got his first job. So, of course, a lot of the ladies and people in the church were kind of worried about him. So we wanted everything on that table back over there I want to show you is his. And that's supposed to help him get into his new place. I didn't understand the toilet paper part because <laughs> most, most, most boys, you know, they don't ever buy soap and toilet paper. They go to their parents' house to get it. <laughs> but anyway, Ethan uh, is from our church. He's not here right now. Uh, I wish I, I witnesses, witnessed him firsthand growing up as a young man. We have watched him dress up as an Easter bunny for many years, participate in numerous church activities, read scriptures, poems aloud, role play Christian behaviors, be a place in front of the church, and later became a helper of the children's church, and achieving many successful milestones, such high school graduation. What a sp spectacular event and site I was there. I want to pass this along to him. I want you to pass this on to him for us. For his, his new journey, moving out and on his own for the first time. And so I have a little poem for him too, I guess. Be a humble man, God's man. When the father of lies attempts to deceive, instead embrace the truth, live the truth. Let God's words be the surgeon of your heart, then you will be a truthful man, God's man. When you, fall, when you fail, be teachable. When you fall again, do not quit. When you fail, others repent. When others fail you, forgive them. Then you will be a mature man, God's man. Mom and dad, you have done an outstanding job of ensuring Ethan has received the gift of God and the seeds have been planted. Wishing Ethan the best with his next milestone in life. We are so proud. Please accept our gifts from the church family has collected to help with the new stage of his life. We love you and wish you many blessings. Amen. You make sure you get that. Thank everybody so much. God bless you now. One of the things Harry did not mention, uh, Ethan was in our first confirmation class for this church ever, and uh, never, never missed a day, never missed a study. Either that or he was just incredibly brilliant, which may be the case. Takes after his mother. So anyway, <laughs> all right. So what a blessing it's been to be with you today. I, I hope you come back next week. Should be a lot of fun. 
Um, bring your guests, bring some friends. Uh, we, like Harry said, look in your, look in your, uh, your bulletin because there's a lot of things that are coming up. And uh, not only can we use help on it, but it's just a great way to, to fellowship with others. And you know we're Methodists, so we always have something to eat. So, you know, drop by. May the power of God Almighty, the love of Jesus Christ, the help of the Holy Spirit be with you until we meet again. Amen.